So um, welcome and good morning, afternoon and evening to uh, listeners to this. Um, as Craig said, um, I'm um, a professor of public health and epidemiology at the University of Manchester and wanted to really talk to you um, about the implications of coronavirus and inequalities. I um, feel so privileged uh, to be talking to you today and also sharing a platform uh, with Sherry and with Richard. And we will be having a guest appearance from our boss, um, Professor Kay Marshall at the end, who's uh, going to summarize the session. Um, so I'm sure um, for those of you who've tuned into the other three days, we're relying on your fabulous questions uh, to really tease out the key points for um, a lot of the things that we're going to be discussing today and looking forward to interacting with you via Twitter um, and LinkedIn. Um, my details are here if you'd like to get any further information about any of the things that we're going to be talking about. Um, so really, I'm going to start off with uh, my story um, and the three things that I wanted you to take away from this very brief time that we have together is that we make these inequalities. So the things that we do are actually causing some of the effects that we're seeing, not just locally, but globally. But the upside of it is if we've made them, then we can unmake them and we can make the difference. So if nothing else, what I hope you get from this is the ability to take forwards any interventions that you could possibly do in your own workplace. And I hope that we not only empower you, but then we go on to empower the next generation so that they don't make the same mistakes that we've made. So the next uh, 20 minutes, I'm really going to talk a bit about my own uh, personal experiences and why public health and epidemiology are so core to the principles of medicine and preventative medicine especially, and why it's been so important in my career as a doctor. Um, I don't know if any of you um, uh, listen to the uh, press briefings, um, but the last one um, that was um, uh, aired um, yesterday, really highlighted for me uh, the impact that we have and using coronavirus um, as a lens on public health, I think is crucial for us to go forwards. And what Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus said was, we've got 1 billion people spending 10% of their household budget on healthcare that coronavirus is a story of inequalities. Why have we failed to deliver on health for all in 2020? And most importantly, and this was feeding off the terrible atrocities that are going on globally, that we need peace for health and health for peace. And all of these things have always resonated with me. Um, it was the rationale behind why I changed from being a respiratory doctor to being public health. And through my career, it's been amazing to work with fabulous people. Um, my heroes have been um, uh, fortunate enough for people that I've worked with and people who I've listened to either at um, different lectures or at different conferences, and now with the ability to really search through a number of different YouTube videos and TED Talks, it's been phenomenal, the amount of learning. And so I just wanted to take you back to my first lecture as a brand new lecturer in public health at the University of Manchester. 
And basically it was um, in the middle of us uh, doing all the preparedness after the first SARS outbreak. And um, uh, many of the people that I now have the pleasure of working with uh, were uh, let. Uh, were trainees with me at that time, and Anjana will remember this. Um, we had um, the um, uh, normal lectures to medical students in public health, and the lecturer before me um, was um, from history of medicine, and he basically ended his talk as I was preparing to start mine with. Um, uh, the whole fact that we would not see a pandemic in our lifetime. And so it was very fortunate that I was able to uh, reconfigure my talk so that I could say with certainty that we would be seeing a pandemic in our lifetime. And sadly, we've had several um, from uh, the various different um, respiratory pandemics, but also we mustn't forget um, the pandemics that are inherent across the globe um, in other communicable diseases. And even though we are focused on coronavirus, it's important that we don't forget all the other things. And emergency preparedness, response, resilience and recovery has never been as important as it is now. So um, we set off on our little journey, uh, both through teaching on the Masters of Public Health, but also being very fortunate to work with a number of different international and national organizations to really think through public health locally, nationally and internationally. And one of the key things that this allowed us to do was work with different organizations. We've been a World Health Organization um, collaborating center on health indicators. And um, we were um, one of the founding members of the um, urban health section of UFA. And I'd like to do a huge shout out to UFA and WHO for giving the opportunities um, that we've had um, in, a, in order to really uh, promote our work on health indicators and urban health. Without these two organizations, I think a lot of the work that we've been able to do locally would not have formed all of the research projects and all of the things that we've been able to do with all these fabulous partners um, and it's growing all the time uh, that we've been able to work with for public health and urban health specifically. Um, so our work on urban health really started um, early on uh, with our Professor of Public Health, Dick Heller, um, and he really um, spotted with um, Chris Burt the need for urban health monitoring. And from that, we were able to get some um, funding from what was called DG Sanko from the EU um, to look at um, indicators. And this really um, was a phenomenal time because we were seeing the switch from most of the world's population going from rural communities to urban communities. When we drilled down, we saw from the data that in fact where this was happening wasn't in um, the high income countries but in lower min middle income countries and the growth of mega cities was just enormous in um, lower middle income countries where we were rapidly seeing the rise of 20 million people in a, an urban conurbation at any time. And what we really found was the need for strong leadership. And at the same time, we were seeing a lot of initiatives from healthy cities um, that WHO propagated to the urban leaders forums, and also some key work from the International Society of Urban Health. And I know um, Greg was able to get uh, Joe, who's been a mentor 
and a close friend of ours for several uh, decades now um, that really formulated the blueprint for urban health. And I think um, the key things for us was um, being able to really look at some of these um, different uh, historical uh, leadership quotes. And the one that I always um, look at um, is tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. And I think that's um, been a key component of the work that we've been doing both locally and internationally. And some of the assumptions behind the work that we've been looking at, looking through the discourses, the grey literature, as well as peer reviewed literature, is even though we've caused these inequalities to happen, I think we have um, an underlying assumption that people want to do good. And therefore, that means that we need to know what all the different actions and all the different levers and the influences are in a very complex social, medical and international setting. So what we need to do to understand when things go wrong is understand people, groups and unintended consequences. And um, we'll be talking about Professor Sir Michael Marmot um, uh, throughout this talk. But one of the key things that has been uh, flowing through, and this was a quote from the 80s, was that even though we see these general improvements, we won't see them happening across all of the different sectors. And it doesn't matter if we look at the UK or if we look at um, things like mortality rates across the globe, we are seeing the widening of these inequalities that have been happening um, for um, millennia now. And now that we're able to actually monitor and see what our actions are doing, we're actually able to see all of the differences that have been happening across the globe with all of the different inequalities. And um, coronavirus is one of the things that we're going to use as an exemplar. Um, so I always like to show this to our medical students because this is very pertinent to um, Greater Manchester. Uh, this is Edwin Chadwick, and he was regarded as one of the pioneers of public health. He looked at data. He was an epidemiologist. He was um, very interested in the social and wider determinants of health. He brought about unprecedented change in Victorian Manchester that was seeing the industrialization of its communities and the mass migration into urban areas. But with that came huge poverty, um, problems with occupational health, so issues um, that he was reporting on from both overcrowding um, and all of the uh, terrible circumstances of child labour all the way through to industrial accidents and the um, reporting of respiratory disease from um, mill workers. But then he moved on to thinking about some of these social circumstances and his thoughts were perhaps that to alleviate poverty in Victorian Britain, uh, the way that we can best help uh, these uh, poorer communities was through the development of workhouses. And this separated families and had huge social implications, including the widening of inequalities in Victorian Britain. And I always use this as an exemplar of how things that we do might have unintended consequences. Um, this is for Greg. Um, this is, um, again, one of the key things 
uh, that we used in terms of looking at inequalities. And um, I always ask the medical students, where, where is this? And this was actually looking at um, informal settlements. And this was Detroit um, in the 1990s after the decline of the car industry and uh, thinking through uh, the comparisons that we can make both from low and middle income countries and high income countries. And it really sparked the interest in urban health and prevention specifically. Um, so this is another story of Geoffrey Rose, another one of my heroes. And uh, key to all of public health has been uh, prevention being much better than cure. I'm sure all of you will know uh, that primary in, uh, prevention, where we're looking at how we can improve the health and well-being of our population well before they even know that they need us. Then thinking about secondary prevention through screening and early case finding, and then tertiary prevention. So when somebody has a disease, how do we prevent mortality and morbidity from that disease? And what Jeffrey Rose really taught us was that people that we're trying to intervene with both from a primary prevention and a secondary prevention may not know they need us because they are completely without symptoms and may accuse us of being the nanny state. And I would include this with policymakers as well, thinking through how we get across um, primary prevention, whether that's emergency preparedness to help us learn from the current coronavirus pandemic and putting in place prevention um, and resilient policies so that we can prevent uh, further pandemics from having such an effect is quite crucial. We all know um, that inequalities are important and the wider and social determinants, so the rainbow diagram um, that was used in a number of publications that we've worked in from urban health and thinking through how uh, we've taken the learning from um, Sir Michael Marmot's Social Determinants of Health Commission's work and really thinking through these key things about the fact that we need to still look at um, the living conditions, thinking about the inequities of the distribution of power, money and resources, and then thinking through what the impacts of our actions are. Because basically, we can't um, understand the context without working out um, what those levers are. And within the context where we have a global dual economy, where we don't know the needs of our neighbours, we have two societies living side by side, whether that's in um, a city or whether we're thinking about processes and mechanisms or where we're looking at the global context and thinking about planetary health and looking at the urban paradox in terms of the huge um, uh, benefits from having cities and the economic wealth that's driven from the powerhouse that are our urban areas and then thinking of equality from that. And a lot of the global health work is based around looking at the contradictions. At uh, some point we have water shortages here and we get um, very uh, upset when we can't water our garden or clean our cars through to the fact that the biggest child killer globally is still waterborne diseases um, in low and middle income countries. We have huge issues of obesity and food waste where we have half of our population of, uh, in hunger our need for things, including cheap clothes, 
um, and cutting edge technologies and how that has an impact on pillaging natural and human resources from low and middle income countries and thinking through the working conditions of the urban poor who are basically servicing our need for more and more things. And some of the work um, that's gone into looking at medical care um, has focused on these social determinants. We know um, from work that's been done uh, from the 70s that what we've done in medicine has contributed relatively little to improvements in mortality. And Bunker was actually able to then uh, think about this uh, in terms of life expectancy and quantify it that in the uh, 1900 to 1950, only two years of the 23 years have affected life expectancy in three out of the seven years from the 1950s. And I really wanted to bring in Don Berwick at this point. So this is my first bullet point that we have created these systems and what he's really uh, done phenomenal work on is the fact that as public health, as clinicians, as um, civil society, we need to understand these systems so that we can make things better. And I think um, Tudor Hart, who said this in the year that I was born, is still true today. And again, it doesn't matter if I'm talking about Manchester or globally, the availability of medical care and the health for all principles are not being serviced throughout our populations. And within the equity domain, we've seen um, both the Commission of Social Determinants reporting, uh, we've seen the EU reporting, we've had the Marmot Review that was updated this year um, for the 10 year follow up and looking at what that means. Um, so here's the data from the first Marmot Review. Um, and uh, this showed that people in working age from the most deprived communities were suffering ill health. And um, this was from the 10 year follow up. And if you have a chance to look at the um, website um, for the review, uh, you can see a lot more data. I've just pulled out this one slide that showed the difference in um, spend and funding uh, based on uh, the index of multiple deprivation and the decreases in funding have been phenomenal between the most deprived areas and the least deprived areas. And that really brings in equity. And if we define this as our differences in needs, treatments and outcomes, and we need to look at equity to make sure that globally we think through how we equally distribute it. And we get inequities when organizations does, don't reflect need. We don't think about the distribution of health and we don't think about all of the uh, disadvantaged groups and the gradients and the exclusion that this causes. And we know that we have a trade-off between efficiency and equity, so the key core goal that Marmot had at the beginning, um, which was that if we only focus on whole populations, we'll not narrow the health gap. If we look at equality as being the outcomes of these equity and efficiency um, decisions that we're making, and inequalities are the outcomes from not having equal services and equal quality. And I'm sure many of you have seen this slide already. And wouldn't it be great if we can use the current pandemic to really rip down this wall? And focusing on what Joseph Stiglitz has said, that we are um, inherent in all of us is the focus where private investment will not go. And he's speaking here specifically on poverty. And I'd like to also um, propose um, that you visit um, Professor Phil Hanlon's website and thinking about how we do this 
um, in terms of modern public health. So just to end on coronavirus, uh, many of you were um, probably working on our response to the first coronavirus outbreak um, that started in China uh, with one in 10 deaths and um, thinking through uh, what that means now. Um, you'll have seen the data. Uh, so this was pulled off yesterday where we now have over 4 million confirmed cases and 293,000 deaths globally um, from this fabulous resource from John Hopkins. Um, the Office of National Statistics has been looking at some of the data um, and I'm just pulling off some of the work from looking at England and Wales as an exemplar to basically show you that coronavirus is also a tale of inequalities, both locally and internationally. And um, this graph shows that um, the data, if you look at deaths by occupation, we're seeing a significant difference between those in low skilled occupations. And then if we look at ethnicity, um, we're, uh, by males and females, where we are seeing in England and Wales more deaths in males and females. And also, um, if we look at the recent analysis that ONS have done, we've seen that deaths um, are twice as likely if we uh, compare blacks to whites, and this is for males, and we can see that being replicated in females as well. Looking at um, the index of multiple deprivation for England, again, we can see both all deaths and coronavirus deaths are following the same pattern, where those in our most deprived communities are suffering the most from coronavirus. And we've looked at um, a lot of the literature and I'm very grateful for my team at the university who've been doing phenomenal work uh, doing um, rapid reviews of the literature and also providing a free resource. And thank you to Margarita who's been um, creating our um, Mendeley uh, database of the um, huge amounts of COVID-related evidence that's coming through both in the grey literature and in the um, published literature. And the rationale behind this is really um, the um, fact that we are showing that inequalities on a global scale is being brought to the front through coronavirus and we mustn't let this um, uh, opportunity fail us to make a difference on inequalities. And we wrote a recent blog um, with our colleagues, Nasima and Bella, um, from um, our work in the local community. And one of the key things that we found was um, from the literature that we have this voice and we must prevent stigma and that we must try to take everybody with us and leave no one behind. We had a look at some of the work and we know that we can inform immediate and long-term strategies to build empathy and most importantly, social justice. And this needs to carry favour both now and for all future pandemics, be that for respiratory diseases or all other um, communicable diseases. And I know uh, Cherian will be talking about our current issue with non-communicable diseases also. Uh, we looked at some of the data from nationally and even though we might be flattening the curve, we know that we've got a long way to go. And looking at the data from our um, primary care colleagues, um, we know that we've got um, a lot of work to be done both locally and internationally. So I take it back to what Don said. 
We need to understand our systems for coronavirus, for communicable diseases, for the global community that we live in and the explosion that we're going to have in terms of if we do nothing, in terms of non-communicable diseases. And some of the work that we've been doing has been feeding into our public health masters um, that's online. And we welcome any uh, thoughts that you might have. And our hub that's linking up data science with public health and clinical medicine is fundamental to the work that we're doing um, for open access courses for you, including um, the fabulous work um, that Greg and the team have done for European Public Health Week. And I will just leave it with um, the fact that we need to take control. And if it's not us, then who? And back to the three things, we can make a difference. We need to feel empowered. We need to empower the next generation. And we hope here at the University of Manchester with UFA and the urban health section, we're able to help you on that journey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that talk, Apana. Um, we've got a few questions before we move over to Sherry and that have come in. Um, so the first one is uh, COVID related. Do you think that terminology such as saying that COVID-19 does not discriminate is a problematic line by the government and the media during this pandemic? I think it's useful um, in terms of some of the key things that we need to uh, get across to the population as a whole. Um, that the things that we've learned from past pandemics is um, social distancing uh, or physical distancing, as I believe we're um, meant to call it, is our first line of defence. Where we don't have testing and the ability to uh, know who may or may not have the virus, one of the key things that's coming through from the evidence base that's going to both flatten the curve where in low resource settings we can't do testing for all the people needed and we perhaps can't offer um, the things like masks, hand washing facilities and all of the key things that we would want our populations to do is that we have social distancing and the ability to basically protect our populations. So having that wording is very powerful to try to get across that where things that we would like to do, we can't do. But on the other hand, in terms of stigma and in terms of being able to ensure that we leave no one behind, and I mean um, uh, our um, older populations, our populations with other conditions. I think it's really important that we make sure that we use the right terms to be able to really connect with them so that we can tackle this pandemic. Thank you. And the next question was, um, how do you think the reduction in trust in experts has impacted on public health professionals in tackling COVID-19? I think it's very important that we recognise what's re reported in the media versus what is happening um, in real life. And I think that um, we have some very powerful uh, media voices. And this is the crux of um, seeing this as an opportunity as public health professionals to be that voice so I'm taking uh, time out to talk to anybody from the press who will talk to me to try to get that voice across. Um, we have um, a lot of experts that are advising international, local and national policy makers. And I think it's important that uh, the truth is uh, reported back to our communities and um, being able to really think through these messages 
is the empowerment that I hope everybody who's listening today feels that they can do. So challenging some of the things that they might be seeing in social media or the mass media and being able to really propagate the truth is something that I hope that we all come together, whether we're public health or civil society, um, to be able to really get across the true messages and fight some of the uh, false messages and all of the issues that we have with the fake news uh, problem. Um, and I don't see any difference now than before. I think as public health, we have to seize this opportunity to make our voices heard. If not now, then when? Thank you. That kind of touches upon the next question. Um, somebody's kind of written um, that the that the image of Detroit was quite frightening and different to the images of the United States we often see portrayed in the media. Do you think that inequalities like this are dismissed and diminished by not being fully portrayed in popular culture? Yeah, I think um, the um, the call is right. I think uh, one of the key things that we've got is a very stylized view. And I know from talking to my colleagues who specialize in um, mental health, the impact this has on people, um, whether it be through portrayals on um, in, in media, through portrayals in films, and, um, and newspapers, it doesn't really matter. And I think um, this is where we can learn from big business um, and the whole PR activity. One of the slides that I show the medical students is to do with the budget uh, that a lot of big business has and the influence of big business in terms of behavior. And um, if you do get a chance to look at Phil Hanlon's website, um, it really shows how we in public health need to rethink how we uh, utilize um, some of these channels to be able to get across our messages, our way of social justice, of what's right and also be able to inf influence policy makers on uh, the sustainable development goals and making sure that health for all actually gets implemented. And I can't not mention climate change and the impact on planetary health that we have as um, a small species on this planet of ours and being able to get across the fundamental links between public health and planetary health um, and using this as a platform to really focus on what we're doing in terms of um, the wider uh, climate change issue and being able to put health in all policies is as relevant now as it, it was 45 years ago. Thank you. And one final question quickly before we move on to Sherian. Um, the Director General of WHO, Dr Tedros, said that the right thing and the smart thing to do is to tackle the inequalities that are fueling the crisis. How do you think we can educate the general public so they understand that we will all be more protected if we prioritise protecting the most vulnerable, such as the homeless and those people living in precarious housing? Yeah, I think um, this is something fundamental on a global scale. So whether we're talking about homeless in Manchester or um, some of the um, key things that we've um, been hearing about in the place where I was born, India, uh, from some of the policies that have happened from lockdown and the uh, number of people uh, that haven't been able to make it home. Um, from um, being uh, removed from their work in cities. And uh, I would uh, agree with Dr. Tedros. And I think it's one of the slides that I showed when we're looking at equity. Um, sometimes we need to give um, the most vulnerable more of the resources. And I don't just mean a financial resource, but the fact um, that we need to give them more of the resources that are needed to really um, bring out their stories and being able to then, um, with them, co-create the solutions that will work. 
and their voices are so important in this current outbreak where um, we're talking to our partners and Greg will know this, where um, we're trying to um, think about ventilators, um, whereas they're thinking about basic hand hygiene and how we actually look at the needs of um, the different elements of our society in terms of the resources that they need. If we were able to mobilize the global finances and the national finances to a tune of billions, we need to be thinking about global poverty and the sustainable development goals post pandemic because we know that we can do something because we've been able to mobilize so much during a very short three month period. And I can't see why we shouldn't be able to do this. And supporting WHO must be one of our main goals, whether we're a local public health person or um, civil society and thinking about our global neighbours in those contexts. 